But I've been investigated over and over again by all kinds of American committees and really? FBI and everybody, sure. It's one of our favorite indoor and outdoor sports. <laughs> <laughs> My trouble during the investigation period, what I was being investigated a lot was during the time of the anti-American oh, yeah. McCarthy period, you see. Yeah. And I never got to testify because I kept begging to be allowed to. <laughs> and this was a line of argument that nobody else took. <laughs> and it absolutely stopped them. I said, oh, please let me go and explain why I'm not a communist. Well, we'll let you know, you know. Then one of them earlier in the day, there was one congressional committee which was run by a fellow called Dyes, who ended up in jail for one of those minor crimes that seem to tempt our people in elective office. <laughs> and he was a strong patriot. He wrapped himself in the American flag as fully as it was possible to do. And he had an un-American, or whatever it was called, affairs committee long before McCarthy started. And he sent a few louts over to see me in my office in Hollywood. And they were particularly uneducated and dumb, and they fell into a marvelous trap. Because they said to me, are you a card-carrying communist? Of course, I've never been even faintly pro-communist, but I am a, on the progressive side, as I imagine you've guessed. But I said, will you define what a communist is? And this is when they fell into a trap. So they said, what do you mean? I said, well, just, uh, I, I want to answer your question honestly. How can I answer your question if you don't tell me what you mean? Well, that's, what's communist? Do? Well, I guess it's where whatever you make you, you goes to the government. I said, well, I'm 86% communist. <laughs> The rest is capitalist. <laughs> That's the income tax that one pays. Welcome to Breaking Walls, episode 141. My name is James Scully. Tonight on Breaking Walls, we finish a three part series on the radio career of Orson Welles by picking up as he left the United States for Europe in the late 1940s. For full appreciation, tune into episodes 79 and 104 before hearing this. If this is your first time listening to Breaking Walls, welcome to the show. You can find this series on every podcasting platform and at thewallbreakers.com. Tonight's opening song takes us along the wilderness trail with composer Walter Scharf, originally for National Geographic. It's a perfect composition for a man that inspired hope, fear, bravado, envy, and true creative expression in friends and colleagues during his entire career. Join the Breaking Walls Facebook group to keep in touch with news, snippets, photos, and other additions to the podcast at facebook.com slash groups slash the wallbreakers. And the first eight chapters of Burning Gotham are out everywhere you can get a podcast and at burninggotham.com. It was a 2022 official Tribeca Film Festival audio selection. You can also support these shows for as little as $1 per month at patreon.com slash thewallbreakers. Is it true that your first party was boycotted? I never gave a party for two or three years, no. No, I know where that story comes from. I remember I, it was my Christmas party for the Mercury, for all my people. I gave them all presents I had under the tree, and I'd just been divorced, and I was living alone there with my daughter in my this big house in Beverly Hills and had all these packages and everybody came in and took their Christmas presents away. And I woke up Christmas morning and there was nothing under the tree because nobody had given me anything. That's where the boycott it comes from. Nobody stayed away. It was just a... <laughs> they took what they wanted. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's just a joke story like that. No, nobody ever stayed. I, 
People were terribly nice to me in Hollywood, really. They were. Mm-hmm. Very oh. nice, very nice. There was a big gang of people I never got to know who carried on about me and wrote things and all that, but they weren't people I ever met. People I met were wonderful to me, including the old dinosaur producers and everything. I really, it's not true. I was bad. And how about the older directors? Marvelous. They were the nicest of all to me. The ones I met. I told you I never met Nick Carey. But everybody was, I can't complain. All that thing about badly treated isn't true at all. I never uttered a word of complaint or had any reason to. In 1947, wanting to bring Macbeth to film, Orson Welles teamed with producer Charles K. Feldman to convince Herbert Yates, president of Republic Pictures, to finance. Welles guaranteed to deliver Macbeth on a budget of $700,000. When some members of Republic's board expressed misgivings on the project, Welles agreed to personally pay any overmount of the initial ask. He brought in Irish actor Dan O'Harely as Macduff and cast former child star Roddy McDowell as Malcolm. To cast Lady Macbeth, Wells visited longtime friend and radio legend Jeanette Nolan. The two had known each other since the 1930s in New York. Lady well, Macbeth. Well, Orson came in to that wonderful company of March of Time. We had a Welsh shacked, and he was going to play a Welshman. And of course, that glorious voice. Paul Stewart, who was an actor, as you all know from pictures, but he was always on the air before that. He was on the March of Time and on many other shows. He heard Orson and said that he introduced that voice to the company of the March of Time. And when Orson came in, he was such an overwhelming presence because of his youth. Maybe he was 19 about that time. And he was so gaunt and hungry looking and uh, it was a rough time I don't mean that to be in any way comical because a lot of people were not eating regularly in the theater (laughs) and it was all very obvious in this eloquent performer who gripped us all the minute he opened his mouth it was thrilling absolutely thrilling the voice and the performance was something never to be forgotten. You suppose Orson was ever out of work? I mean, yes, he was he on work. And this was the first was work he? he had had. He was doing, I forget if Ted was with him at that time, I think this was perhaps before Shoemaker's Holiday that he came on March of Time. And things were very, very spare for him. Nolan and her husband, fellow actor John McIntyre, were excited to work with Wells. You asked about Macbeth. He came to our house here. We were surprised when he came. And he described to John and me his idea. And he came to us because he said he wanted Lady Macbeth to be kind of a wife like John had. (laughs) Didn't want her, you know, with all of the evil overtones. And he said... I'm going to try to be like you. You know, he was so funny. I know. John, he loved John. <laughs> he was bringing Dan from Ireland to do Macduff. And so he said to John, the only part you can't play are my part and Macduff. But he <laughs> says, you can play anything else you want. <laughs> and John said, I will only play the part that has the least lines. <laughs> so he said, I don't want to have to learn lines. Oh. But anyway, he described his dream of making what you could almost call an entirely wholesome pair of people out of Lady Mm -hmm. Macbeth and Macbeth, which was surprising to us. We hadn't really read it that way. (laughs) Nor had anyone else. But it was very interesting, and he wanted it to be barbaric. And then he laughed, you know, and he said, of course, your Montana backbone, that'll take care of all of that rustic part of it. But he said... I want it to be all black and all white. And he said, I know I can't get that, but I have a great cameraman who will do the very best he can to make it look like a woodcut. That's how he visualized it. 
Hmm. He wanted it to look like a series of woodcuts. And he said, I want the Scottish. I want that brogue. I want that dialect throughout the cast. That goes with the barbaric aspects of my version in this particular dramatization of Macbeth. So we were quite overwhelmed and amazed that he had come to see us and that he offered us that opportunity to do that. Wells made several changes to Shakespeare's original, like adding significance to the witches. They were played by two other Hollywood radio legends, Peggy Weber and Lorraine Tuttle. Of course, a lot of the shows were put out awfully fast, you know. One summer, I did the Sam Spade show and the Orson Welles show. All at once. It seemed to me they were on at the same time, practically. So I said to Orson, I can't make this rehearsal. I can possibly make the show in about three minutes if I can get from NBC to CBS. But I said, I can't rehearse. And he said, well, come over and rehearse noontime then, during the lunch hour. So I would come over there, and of course, he always loved to talk. And he would talk all through lunch, and I wouldn't get to rehearse with him because he always had a coterie of people around him, you know, and wanted to hear him talk. So I would just sit there, you know, with my script in my hand. Then I'd have to hand the script back because they'd say, oh, there'll be a lot of changes, so you better not take it with you. Wells expressed frustrations with wardrobes and the tight schedule. He had the cast pre-record all their dialogue. Locations were leftover sets from westerns normally made by Republic. The entire production was done in 23 days in July of 1947. In September, Wells signed on to star in Gregory Radoff's Black Magic. Shooting would take place in Rome. He wouldn't return until 1948. Republic initially trumpeted the film as an important work, entering it into the 1948 Venice Film Festival. But it was abruptly withdrawn after poor comparisons with Laurence Olivier's version of Hamlet, also being screened. Life magazine gave the film a terrible review in October of 1948, saying that Wells' days as the boy wonder were long over. When he returned from Europe in the spring, Wells cut 23 minutes from the film at Republic's request and recorded narration to cover some gaps. But when finally released, it too was a disaster. What do you think of Hollywood, Orson? I'm not at all against Hollywood. It's a, uh, I think, a remarkable community with a great history and a very entertaining place to work in. The obvious things against it are so obvious there's really no need to list them over again. Anything you can say about Hollywood is true, good and bad. There's no extreme statement that doesn't apply, I think. In July of 1948, Wells signed on to co-star with Tyrone Power in the Italian film Prince of Foxes. The film would be released in December of 1949. We have suffered a most tragic loss. My dear sister Lucrezia is broken with grief. The court will observe a proper period of mourning. How long to lock her? One year, my lord, sister. One month. The dead must not place too great a burden on the living. It's my belief that everything, even death, can be turned into profit. Our armies hold Pesaro, Rimini, Foli. We're on the road to Urbino, Bologna, Siena, all Tuscany, the center of Italy from coast to coast will be ours. Then inevitably, Milan and Venice. But this devil begotten Ferrara stand blocking our progress. Wells' last appearance in the 1940s on American radio was in a pre recorded segment on mail call over the Armed Forces Radio Service on October 13, 1948. Thank you, Betty Grable. You answered that request beautifully. And now, fellas, while we're on the subject of requests, remember that we're always ready and willing to answer them on good old mail call, even though some of them are unusual. For instance, this morning, as I looked through the file of letters you've sent in the past, I see that some of you missed the good old American commercial announcements that you used to hear over here in the state. And so something is going to be done about that right now. Standing next to me and ready to give his all is that man with the beautiful voice, that radio and picture actor, writer and producer, 
the one and only Orson Welles. A little commercial fanfare, please. Attention, all women over 400 pounds. <laughs> Have you had the feeling lately that you're getting overweight? <laughs> when your husband gives you a hug at night, you have to take his word for it. <laughs> After you get into your girdle, do you look like June is busting out all over? <laughs> If so, you better buy our new patented home reducer called Blubber Rubber. <laughs> Blubber Rubber, spelled backwards, is Edward Arnold. <laughs> Here's all you have to do. It's very simple. Take off your clothes and stand in front of a mirror. Better make that two mirrors. <laughs> Are you looking? Horrible sight, isn't it? <laughs> now lie down on the floor. Yeah, the whole 400 pounds of you. Now, get up. Oh, come on. Try. <laughs> For those of you who don't like exercise, we also sell our famous flab-off reducing pills. Take one pill, you drop five pounds. Take two, you drop ten pounds. Take the whole box and it's bombs away. <laughs> a military figure, try our system for five weeks. You can then wear a pair of slacks without worrying about your rear echelon. <laughs> Women, remember our slogan, don't look like three men in a tubba, we'll change your blubber to hubba hubba hubba. Now 33 years old, Orson Welles had enough of Hollywood. He was in deep debt and needed to move to Europe full time. His first main stop would be in Vienna to star with Joseph Cotton in a new film called The Third Man. Oh, that was perfect, Orson. You gave that commercial a superb delivery. Now the good ship moves.